Howdy once again, this is Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher. Welcome back. This is part three of my series on the micro lathes, particularly the Manson brand here. There'll be about six or more in this series. This is number 932. So in this video, as promised, I'm going to talk about the lathe bed and the carriage and all of that. I'm going to take that apart. Matt said it would be all right to do that. I can't hurt anything. So I think you're going to enjoy that. I hope you watch the first two parts so that you know what I'm talking about here in terms of these tiny little micro lathes. And also we'll pay a little attention to the beautiful little Spanish mahogany box with brass hinges. And in the box, of course, is the accessory kit for the Manson lathe. So thank you Charlie for making these and thank you Matt and Lost Creek Machinery for loaning these to me. Let's get on with the video. I'm really excited about these micro lathes. I hope you are enjoying this video series. So looking at the mahogany box now you can see that there was a decal on the top originally. It's kind of worn away, probably from some man who was setting his coffee cup here over the years. But notice that the box doesn't quite close, and the reason for that is there are some extra tools in here that do not belong in this set. So I'm going to remove the extras right now and include only the parts that are shown in the original documentation. Those are the tools that actually came in the kit. Hopefully they are all there. Removing the excess. Okay, that's more like it. Looks like a little jewelry box, doesn't it? And these are the exact tools or the exact configuration of what we saw in the original. So the other parts were extra. So let's go through all of this, but let me show you what the extras are first. Okay, these are the extra tools that were included that really do not belong in the box. I don't know why there is an extra faceplate, but possibly to be used on the dual lathe, which will be covered later. I think a homemade knockout bar for the collets and these two collets are way too big I do not know what they are but they do not belong in here this is what the collets should look like that size there was an extra three jaw chuck but actually they're not three jaw chucks they are collet chucks and a number one center drill extra dogs and this huge lathe dog. Way too big to use. As you can see this dog is way way too big. In fact it wouldn't even clear the bed if we were to try to use it. And uh, this is die cast. All of these dogs are die cast. Just to give you a sense of scale here this is a quarter inch drill fits perfectly in that little dog and compare it to the penny now this is the other one that I just removed looks massive doesn't doesn't it but yet nothing compared to this average three-quarter inch lathe dog Armstrong type quite a difference okay let's see what's in the box this obviously is a four jaw chuck and it has a threaded backing plate. 71620 is the thread. Reversible jaws. And this is the chuck key, which looks like it's essentially a hex key mounted in a T handle. So we'll be using this later on. And another face plate with threaded holes in it as opposed to the little aluminum one that I showed you earlier which has a dog slot actually this one we call a drive plate and this is a face plate aluminum steel 
two little lathe dogs as I just showed you a little bit earlier in the smaller sizes the correct Allen wrench that I've already been using and then the little drill chuck here cute as can be with the tapered shank is in fact not a regular three jaw as we know it like a Jacobs chuck but it uses collets which are well it's not the same as that is it those are for the spindle this is for the uh, the drill chuck and there only appears to be one that size and it is tiny and I believe it will hold that little center drill. In other words, this is eighth inch. I did measure it. Eighth inch. But it, if it does fit in there, it's a mighty... T yeah, it, it will fit in there. So I might do some center drilling with that later on. And they included two tiny eighth inch square lathe tools, high speed steel. And they are pre-sharpened. I do not think they've ever been used. Notice that they use what we would almost consider excessive clearance angle, side clearance, and even uh, side rake compared to what we're used to. But I believe for soft metals and with a lack of horsepower, that is what would be needed. Now over here are the collets that fit into the spindle. There's four sizes there. There is no drawbar and the way this works for instance with this one if in fact notice there's no threads on the end this would be put into the spindle along with this nose adapter whatever it may be called and when we tighten this when I tighten it, what's this we? It, it basically is pushing this way to collapse the collet around the work about the opposite of what we are used to with a typical 5C collet. Am I telling you too much? As I just said there are four of these little collets and the largest is 1 8 inch. The smallest here I mean it's just tiny. Matter of fact I had to get out this little set of drill bits and the only one that would fit in there is, is I've got duplicates here was what is it that I have missing there I gotta put my glasses on to even read that that's a number 76 now I'm not kidding you you'd have to buy three dozen of these wouldn't you because you're gonna break them like crazy what a difference let me show you what it says in the original directions and they give the sizes but this one is much smaller one than what they mentioned. Here are the collet sizes. 1 32nd, 1 16th, 3 32nds, and 1 8th. But I tell you, this one sure is a heck of a lot smaller than 1 32nd. Just for a comparison here, this is the Manson chuck. This is an Albrecht chuck made in Germany. You've seen it before. This is the smallest chuck three-jaw chuck that I am aware of. It's a keyless chuck and this is a $500 chuck but I didn't think they made them any smaller than this. Than this. And I do not in th think that it is, uh, they would be able to scale down a three-jaw chuck into this size and that's why they're using collets. Nice little jeweler's lathe. As I mentioned earlier this is exactly what came from the factory like the picture so you will be seeing this several times throughout this video series but just wanted to see you show this to you the way it originally appeared remember they made these boxes the earlier ones out of wood and then they also made them out of metal and even plastic during their six or eight year run it wasn't really very long one thing I haven't pointed out yet that this looks like lamp cord. I don't know if it's the original cord or not, but it is not grounded. It is not the three wire system. So this little machine really should be rewired with the ground for your personal safety. All right, let me get back to the parts lathe right here. And I'm going to take the carriage off of the bed. And then we'll examine the back side of the apron. 
Look at how outrageously large my hands look, and my hands aren't that big. But I wish that Henry had the skill set so that he could work on this, but even his hands would be a little bit too big, and ideally someone needs to have the hands the size of a six-month-old baby to handle this. And then, you know, when I do this, you can't even see what I'm doing, so, all right, that's my disclaimer. The tail stock comes off just as easily as it does on the South Bend lathe. Just loosen up the locking clamp, slide it off, and I've already talked about this in the previous video, so I won't beat that horse to death. There has been no rehearsal, so I'm not sure if I can get the carriage off of the bed without taking anything apart, but I can see that it will not slide off from this end because of the bearing here for the lead screw. There is no lead screw in this piece, so I'm thinking I can slide it off, and I put a little oil on here, this end. Let's see if that is a truism or wishful thinking. Yes, it was wishful thinking. Do you remember that great country song from the 60s by the wonderful Wynn Stewart called Wishful Thinking. I'm guilty of that myself sometime. All right, the reason this won't come off from this direction is the gear right here is striking this part of the casting here. So it won't go any farther. I'm glad I didn't try to force it. So you know what I'm going to do to take this off? and It'll be simple enough. I'm going to remove the rack because there are just two screws. Philister had one here and one here. The rack should pull out, I hope and uh, then we can take the carriage off of the bed. All right, I've got the screws loose. Let's take those off. And the rack has a little bend to it, because it's really sheet metal when you think about it. And it seems to be seized a little bit, probably by dried oil. Oh, there it goes. Now, there may be some people out there that do not know what a rack is, but a rack is simply a straight gear. Think of rack and pinion steering on a car or an arbor press. And that looks like it's only about a sixteenth of an inch thick. I'll clean this all up real good upon reassembly. Now will this come off? You know, i got to make sure that I have the carriage lock loose enough. Yeah, it was loose. Matter of fact, it was too loose. Let's wreck. And there it is. Let's examine the bed just a little bit closer before I work on the carriage. Am I moving too slow or too fast? This is just a beautiful little cast iron casting. You know, and I couldn't help think when I was taking these screws out that I bet when they manufactured these, there was a tremendous amount of scrap and waste as they goofed up parts. It's bound to happen. So there's the bed, and on the bed there are the V-ways. So with a toothbrush donated by my wonderful wife, I will clean it up just a little bit now. You know what? I bet when I kiss my wife goodnight tonight that her breath will smell like three-in-one oil, which is not bad. So now for the scotch bright. I'm making several observations as I take this apart and examine it, but they apparently made these in different versions, uh, different you know, improvements over time. But the cross slide, remember there's no compound, this cross slide on the parts lathe is made of steel and is magnetic. But, as you remember from the last video, this one is aluminum. So which is older? I'm thinking that this is the older machine and there are serial numbers. So that's the serial number off the one I'm taking apart, and they stamped it on both sides, I guess, so Bubba couldn't put it on backwards. I really don't know. But 
reading this serial number here, and I wrote them down on a card. The top number is this machine, and the bottom number is the part slave, which I think the part slave, therefore, is, uh, is newer, if we can go by that serial number there. And the B and D are perhaps batch numbers, just a guess. As mentioned in the last video, the stainless steel sheet metal angle iron here, and I'm, again, I don't know why they made it out of stainless steel, is adjustable so that it, uh, the wear, or <laughs> the clamping force on uh, the bed is, can be adjusted for wear. I can't imagine there ever being wear. I started to take these two screws off, and they were really tight. I do not want to break a screw off. So I'm not going to go any farther with uh, disassembly, nor do I intend to take the cross slide off because that's already been done. But let's talk about the controls. Let's take a look at how the controls work on this little lathe, on this little carriage. Actually, the carriage here is all one piece. Normally, on an atlas or whatever, uh, there's two pieces in the top part that rides on the bed is called the saddle and the front part is the apron but it's, it's really all in one and by the way I just noticed here that the rack is made of stainless steel probably for toughness so they didn't have to heat treat it because it's so thin and there is warpage can you see the warpage that would have been caused probably by cutting the teeth which caused this to curl on both ends and it's not real flat this way but apparently it doesn't matter boy I've beaten that thing to death haven't I but before I was so rudely interrupted by myself I was talking about <laughs> the carriage hand wheel and it's on a little shaft and there's a little brass gear turning the large gear and that's a cluster gears so the smaller gear that is on the same shaft is the one that rides on the rack to move the carriage back and forth on the bed just like a big lathe but wait I'm not done do you remember that this is the carriage lock and on a south bend, there's usually a square bolt there. But if you, when you tighten this down, and you've seen me do it, this is, where's my pointer here? This is the carriage lock right here. So when we tighten that little screw that I just mentioned, it clamps against the bed. I'll just stick the rack in there to demonstrate and pinches the bed. Pretty simple. And of course this is the threading lever. It's not the half nut lever, it's not the split nut lever because it isn't really a split nut, it's kind of a modified type of nut right here. Can you see the little threads on it? So the way that works, let's just pretend that this is the lead screw running through there. And when you start to thread, it just comes into that position and engages the screw. Now I'm going to oil everything here before I put this back together because that's pretty darn stiff. But I'm not going to take it apart as I mentioned earlier. I love this little ball crank. However, it is die cast and probably quite delicate. And I suppose that's the set screw to fasten it to the shaft. Notice that there are no graduations on that little dial. There are, however, graduations on the dual lathe, which I will be dealing with a few videos from now. If the carriage would ever wear, and it certainly wouldn't be the cast iron V-ways, it would be the aluminum here. If it does wear and the carriage became sloppy, and we needed to tighten it, there is provision for that. And that concerns this screw, which I talked about before. And in this hole is a little set screw. And uh, let's talk about that now. So this screw is on, a, I believe it's on a cam. So taking it off of the bed, 
comes off pretty easily now, doesn't it? In order to make that adjustment, we would take this tiny little hex key Allen wrench that can be used on just about every screw on this machine. And I can feel it when it engages the little set screw, I think. Yeah, now it's in. So I would loosen that, which I'm not going to do. But as I, after I loosen it, you see this little part right here, and it is brass. We need some more light on that, or do we? No, that's good. But there's a shaft on it, or a screw, I'm not sure. But once this is loosened, we take a screwdriver, a larger one than this, and this should be installed on the bed when you do that. You could snug it up, not too tight, just snug it up. And once you get the fit that you desire, you would relock the set screw again. Pretty complicated little piece, isn't it? Imagine making this. If this was your job, say, by Friday, Joe, I want you to make one of these from the blueprint and put it on my desk. Could it be done in a week? You'd have to make ten of them, wouldn't you? To get a halfway decent one? <laughs> now, I, one last thing here. This is a die casting here, so the V grooves are die cast, and that, I think I said aluminum? Well, it is aluminum. This is aluminum die cast, not uh, Zemeck. So those two little things are pretty easy, pretty uh, interesting. And this is really a lot simpler than, say, a South Bend carriage. You've seen me take those apart many times, and they are quite intricate. But remember, there's no crossfeed. There's no power crossfeed. That simplifies it a little bit. But, I, boy, wouldn't that be complicated if they wanted to, to make a power crossfeed? When I started making this episode, I thought, well, I hope I have enough material here for at least five to six minutes worth. But I think this ran... 20 already, which most of mine do. I hope it wasn't too long for you, and I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please give me a thumb up and tell your friends who are interested in micro lays, and maybe some of these videos will even be linked to some of the small lathe, uh, well, what do you call them, chat rooms, micro lays. If not, tell those people on those chat rooms about this. I will. I'm hoping that this type of video will get some attention, but if it doesn't, so be it. I enjoyed making this video, and I enjoy working with this, even if only 10 people watch. But I think there'll be more than that. So if you did like it, again, give me a, a thumbs up and uh, all of that. Remember, you will not get notifications, most of you, on my videos, so do a search weekly for Tubal Cane or Mr. P222 because I typically put out two or three videos per week. That is approximately 150 videos that I made during 2023. So, this is Mr. Pete saying so long for now. I'll see you next time in uh, the next chapter where I actually attempt to do a little machining with this micro lathe. Bye. Lots of still pictures at the end. Check them out.